So I'm Gail Brewer, um, City Council Member for the West Side and also Chair of the Committee on Technology and Government. And we're here um, today to talk about a resolution, uh, 1495. Um, this is a topic that I think is somewhat known to those of us who are in the technology world and perhaps in economic development, but it is certainly something that we have a lot to learn about, so it's quite exciting. Um, the background of this resolution is that the Internet utilizes a domain name system known as DNS, which uses names to reach websites. Uh, the domain names are separated by dots, and the last label in the sequence is called the top-level domain, known as TLD. I think we're very familiar with com and org and US. TLDs with two letters are country codes, CCTLD, that are operated by managers on a local basis, and TLDs with three or more characters are called generic codes, GTLD. The DNS, which of course is the domain name system, currently consists of over 20 generic codes and around 250 country codes. Something that is becoming much better known is ICANN, the Interna Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. It's a globally recognized private-public partnership that is responsible for the coordination of domain names worldwide and there are members from all over the world, and sometimes you'll be at a rally and somebody will say they're an ICANN member and they can't talk to you because they're looking at your city. It's kind of um, a good combination of public and private sector individuals. ICANN was created through a memorandum of understanding with the United States Department of Commerce to transfer management of the DNS from the United States government to the international community. There are now new TLDs. The most wanted TLD.com, which we're all very familiar with, is being, used, is being used by 80 million websites, making it hard for a new company to find a combination of letters that have not already been utilized. In June 2008, ICANN passed new rules that allow any company or country to apply for a new TLD while also permitting new names to be in scripts other than Roman characters. ICANN is expected to issue guidelines for the new TLDs in the coming months, and the application period may begin in late 2009. The issue of new TLDs is somewhat complicated. Because of the new rules, many organizations and individuals have created plans to apply for a city TLD that would be used by local businesses that are apropos to that neighborhood and that city, civic organizations and city governments, although city governments often have GOV. Berlin, Paris, and Portland, Oregon have shown interest in purchasing a TLD of their own. Advocates of regional TLDs believe that these new domains will create more options for new companies looking for a web address and give local businesses access to memorable domain names that will help in marketing their company to the community. City TLDs will also aid in marketing a city globally to tourists and international business owners and create a more organized internet that will be easier to navigate. So we're talking about this issue today because the city of New York although not testifying today as a city government, is certainly interested in this topic, and ICANN will be working on issuing RFPs, requests for proposal on this topic, and the city of New York, in some form, will be responding to the RFP, and will certainly be making comments regarding the RFP. So the reason we're here today is to uh, sort of jumpstart the process, uh, make sure that people understand and are educated on what uh, ICANN is doing and what the, I think the benefits, but people may have other comments uh, regarding a TLD for the City of New York. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, thank Colleen Padgett for her work in terms of putting this hearing together and certainly Jeff Baker, who's counsel to the committee, and uh, Kunal Malcha from our office. And um, the uh, f folks from the uh, uh, finance Division of the City Council. So without further ado, we'd like to call the, the father of TLD, Tom Lownhout, who is uh, 
the one who has brought all of us together on a many chance, many opportunities on this topic. Tom, why don't you join us? And you can introduce whomever is with you today. Uh, I'm Thomas Lowenhaupt. Other than my college years, I've been a lifelong New Yorker, having lived in Queens and Manhattan. For the past 27 years, I've lived in Jackson Heights with my wife, Patricia. My career for the past 30 years has been as a developer of state-of-the-art interactive technologies, developing projects for such giants as Citicorp and Verizon's predecessor organizations. But I've mostly worked for smaller organizations. Beginning in... Sorry, distracted here. Beginning in 1992, I served for 14 years as a member of Queens Community Board 3, holding seven posi several positions, including vice chair and chair of its technology committee. My education includes a BA from Queens College with a focus on government studies and a master's degree from NYU's Interactive Telecommunications Program. Since 2005, I have been engaged full-time advocating for the acquisition and development of the .NYC top-level domain. I'd like to begin by offering my thanks to the committee's chair, Gail Brewer, for introducing and providing the opportunity to comment on Resolution 1495. And I would like to thank our, the co-sponsors, Council Members Leroy Comrie, Robert Jackson, Letitia James, John Liu, Annabelle Palmer, Larry Seabrook, and Thomas White, Jr. I'm joined at the table by Michael Palage, our, consul, our ICANN advisor. Michael is an attorney, an expert on Internet's domain name system, and a former board member of the ICANN, the organization with responsibility for issuing the .NYC top-level domain. Michael will comment on the ICANN application process and governance issues. And I'm joined by Hannah Koppelman, a technology advocate and artist and head of our resident advisory network. A Hannah will comment on the way the public can participate in our decision-making processes. My presentation will touch on five areas. Why a TLD, what's a TLD and why it's important to New Yorkers and New York City. Second, I'll review the origin of our organization and why, what we've done to date. Third, what still needs to be done. Fourth, how city government can help. And finally, some closing remarks. First, what's a TLD and why is it important? The .NYC TLD is like .com, .org, or .gov, but just for New York City. Upon acquiring .NYC, we will have the ability to issue the entire set of second-level domain names under .NYC. Familiar second-level second level domain names under the .com world are AOL, Yahoo, Amazon, Google.com. Why is it important for New York City to get a TLD? The first thing we get with a TLD are good domain names. Good domain names are those that are short, descriptive, and memorable. Coke.com, IBM.com, these are good domain names. In New York City, short is especially important in the realm of retail, where stores need to identify themselves using the available signage above their establishments. Joe's Bar.NYC might fit on that sign above the store, while Joe's Bar in NewYorkCity.com doesn't. So, domain names, so good domain names are short, descriptive, and memorable. Our efforts originated in Jackson Heights, where most of the residents are immigrants or young adults just starting out in the business world. Neither of these groups were around in 1995 when the good dot-com names were available. Today there are no good dot-com names left in, no good dot-com dot names left. None. 80 million names have been issued. When we receive the rights to dot NYC, we will have the full set of domain names. Good domain names for small businesses. Joe the Plumber dot NYC. Julia's Writings dot NYC. Or Igor's Bright Idea dot NYC. Juan's Cars dot NYC. The second thing that comes with domain names is identity. Every one of these good domain names will say made in or from New York City. Portals are a third benefit. Names such as schools.myc and hospitals.myc will organize our resources for residents. And for tourists and business visitors, there will be portals such as hotels.myc and tours. Perhaps more important is the role .myc can play in, can play in enabling residents to connect with, a, with one another. A city's traditional role is that of a meeting place where ideas and goods are shared and exchanged. With the globalization that was enabled in large part by the dot-com internet, our city no longer benefits from proximity as it once did, and there is no New York City on the internet. There are other benefits such as more intuitive internet and being more findable in search engines. These benefits are discussed in detail on our website. Next, I'd like to discuss connecting .NYC's origin and those things we've done to make .NYC a reality. I set our official birth date in April 19, 2001, the day Queens Community Board 3 passed the Internet Empowerment Resolution calling for .NYC's acquisition. 
After its passage in 2001, our council members, congress members, and borough president took steps to make the resolution a, a reality. City Hall also took notice, but the 9-11 tragedy took Dada NYC off the front burner as we addressed far more vital matters. In 2003, when the ICANN issued a request proposals for a proof of concept of new TLDs, I initiated an effort to encourage City Hall to submit an application. But more pressing matters faced the city and the opportunity passed. In 2005, I was contacted by the developers of the Dock Berlin TLD, who encouraged me to again pursue the effort. My initial inclination was to encourage an existing organization to do so, and I con contacted several. But after some discussion and recalling my failure in 2003 to ignite some effort, and more importantly, having examined the nature of the operation of a TLD, I concluded that a not-for-profit corporation, broadly representative of, of our diverse city, and committed to the operation of a TLD in the public interest was the best approach. And in 2006, we, initiate, we initiated steps to create Connecting.NYC, Inc., a New York State not-for-profit. Connecting NYC seeks a more city-friendly internet where a carefully planned and managed TLD will make it easier for both residents and visitors to locate city resources within a safe environment. What we've done. We created our not-for-profit to acquire and develop the TLD. Our not-for-profit status arises by virtue as our learn of, of our long-term role as an educator of the public about .NYC and the multiple roles it can play in our city's growth and development. That educational role will be small at the outset, but sustained for the long term as we train and educate New Yorkers about the role and possibilities of a TLD. Our application for our IRS 501c3 status is pending. We developed several online resources. We have a website at connectingnyc.org that has a petition on it. If you've not signed it, please do so. We have a wiki with over 100 pages of ideas and resources on how, to, how the New York TLD can become a reality that serves the public interest of New York and New Yorkers. It works like Wikipedia and enables the public to participate in our deliberations. And in December 2007, we started a blog. To my mind, it's the most engaging part of our online effort. Locally, we've met in person with over 85 organizations to explain our proposal. Chambers of Commerce, city, civic organizations, Kiwanis clubs, community boards, government departments. We've made presentations at conferences at the Grassroots Media Conference, the New Media Day at LaGuardia Community College. We attended dozens of civic events to explain our effort, answer questions, and seek, and seek suggestions. In January, we initiated the Civics Project to identify the names of neighborhoods and civic organizations so that we might set them aside to make them available when we begin to issue .NYC domain names. We've met with our local city and state officials, with members of the city council, do it three of the borough presidents, and we've reached out to NYC and company. In June, during Internet Week, we handed out flyers in front of the municipal building asking city employees to provide their ideas on domain names we might set aside to aid the operation of local government. We reached out globally as well and to other cities seeking TLDs. We developed a Paris understanding, an emerging agreement on sharing best practices by developers of .city domains for Paris, Barcelona, Berlin, and New York City. We're working with ICANN to create on their website a place where their experiences with governance, particularly multi-stakeholderism, will be organized for use by the developers of city TLDs. We've attended ICANN-related meetings in Prague, Paris, Puerto Rico, Los Angeles, and Washington, D.C. to familiarize the ICANN community about the needs of cities and the role TLDs play in facilitating local communication. And we've, set, and we've met with the U.S. Department of Commerce to appraise them of the importance of city domains to good city governance and the creation of a more livable city. Finally, we recently began a round of meetings with our city for our city civic name project that will take us to the city's 59 community boards. We've been two so far. It's going to be a long haul. Fourth, what remains to be done? We need to develop an application that convinces ICANN that we are capable of operating the .NYC TLD with the technical management and financial wherewithal to do so. We need to convince ICANN that we have the support of the city and the community of New York. The most challenging task that I've faced, that we face, has been creating a governance structure for our organization. As we've met with dozens of organizations and hundreds of people over the past few years, a consistent issue I've raised is governance. How do people think .NYC oversight should be organized and if they'd like to participate? Today we have four members on our board of directors and I believe a fifth is coming on board soon. These are all individual members who are enthusiastic about the effort, technologically adept, and have committed time to develop time to devote to the effort. Uh, John Moran, one of our board members, is here. I 
thank him for showing up today. Uh, but there's a more important membership cadre that we'd like that we seek to include in our governance structure, existing institutions. For example, last year we met and discussed with Queensborough President Helen Marshall about her interest in serving on our board. She suggested that all the borough presidents be represented in ex officio capacities. We're working to implement that now. We would also like to have a representative of the city council on our board. As well, several city entities that will have a special connection with domain names should be represented in our governance processes. NYC and Company do it, consumer affairs and small businesses, minimally. Finally, the chambers of commerce should be represented and civil society. How can the city help us? The ICANN, the organization responsible for issuing the .NYC TLD, requires that a city TLD applicant provide evidence of approval by its city. If we are to move forward in an expeditious manner, we require a clear indication of support from the City Council. As well, to avoid possible confusion, we require a similar indication of support from the Office of the Mayor. The ICANN will soon issue the draft RFP indicating, among other things, the fee that must accompany our application. We expect that it will be in the six-figure range. City Council and mayoral approval of our effort will assist us in meeting our funding needs. Our application will also require approval of the U.S. Department of Commerce. City support of our effort will enable us to begin taking steps to secure commerce's okay of our effort. Finally, governance. As I mentioned, there are a number of city entities that, would, that we would like to, be having, to have involved in our governance process. We have postponed making certain decisions until we have a broader and more diverse governance, process, governance structure. With the Council's approval of our effort, we would, seek, we would speak from strength and encourage the chambers of commerce and entities representing libraries and other civil society members to participate in our governance process. In closing, I'd like to address two frequently asked questions. The first question I'm asked is, is there money in it? Once the ICANN made its June 25th decision that cities can have TLDs, money became a frequently asked question. My answer is that there's big money or there's enough money. Big money. If we were to give the .NYC TLD to an avaricious developer without any limitations on its use, there'd be a quick fortune to be made modeling the, dot, modeling the TLD as real estate. How much am I bid for Times Square .NYC? What's the bid for Central Park .NYC? Such an auction would probably raise a considerable bank account for an individual or firm, and I have no doubt that a community benefits package would, would offer to put some of it back into the neighborhoods. The downside of this is we sell our city's soul and have little control of our future. And when a digitally organized dot .Berlin or dot .Paris presents themselves as livable cities where people happily visit and businesses fru fruitfully operate, We'll be at a disadvantage, and we'll have missed a huge opportunity, probably the only one, to plan our city's place in the digital world. With enough money, we, we can allow names to, we can allocate names to those who need or will best develop them, city government, civic organizations, small businesses, to help boost our tourism resources to build the .NYC brand. After, after we've used the TLD to help create a more livable city, .NYC domain names will be highly desirable. With their, with their sale generating excess financial resources that we'll dedicate to our education efforts aimed at reducing the digital divide. The second frequently asked question is, why wouldn't NYC and company or do it take this on? First, it's a totally different line of business. Most basically, operating a TLD involves a highly technical operation of a domain registry that must always work, that must comply with evolving global internet standards, and must network with various root servers around the world. As well, it is imperative that the registry operator coordinate with ICANN and other internet governance agencies, establish standards and processes for determining who gets which name, that it educate the New York City community on the effective use of .NYC domain names to support businesses, community, and the city's global brand. There are many different needs that can be met by the .NYC TLD. For example, of the millions of possible .NYC domain names, NYC and company We'll be interested in developing various tourist names, hotels.nyc, tours.nyc, visit.nyc, and the like, names that promote the city's brand. It is unlikely that its priority would be assuring that civic names are equitably, equitably distributed, that Joseph Smith III gets Joseph Smith III.nyc domain name in a timely manner, and that, Mr. Smith, and that Mr. Smith uses it within standards established by the community. As well, I don't see a city agency being eager to make decisions on sensitive names, e.g., the mayor sucks.myc. We selected our not-for-profit model after seeking the, 
seeing the success of the governance model created for cable TV's public access channels in the early 1980s. In that instance, one, uh, one not-for-profit per borough was created, MNN, QPTV. These arm's length governance, this arm's length governance removes city government from a censor's role, and in the case of a bare breast might be seen on the channels, distance council members and the mayor from irate citizens. Most important, a dedicated entity such as Connecting NYC can support the multiple roles the TLD must play in promoting tourism and small business, civic organizations, city government, neighborhoods, individuals, and making .NYC a medium for addressing the issues and opportunities that face our city. NYC and company, the police department, consumer affairs, do it, small business services, and for-profits could operate the .NYC TLD. But we've established a broad view of the, the TLD's role as supporting the entire New York, New York community. And with 10 years involvement with this development and important connections with New York City and the global internet community, Connecting NYC Inc. brings the expertise and focus to develop the city's TLD in an effective manner. Thank you very much. And if I might, my, well, maybe just questions or do you want to make a comment? Uh, and uh, Hannah, who I'd, I'd like to see, trying to encourage public involvement in our effort and we have a, uh, a network advisory board and she, had, uh, she oversees it and she may would like to say a word uh, at this point. Before she does, I just want to make sure that we introduce our colleagues. Councilmember Bill de Blasio is, was here and I probably had to leave but he was here and Councilmember Oliver Coppell is here. We thank, thank you very much. Um, Hannah, go ahead and say something if you want. I also want to just in the thank Tom Lonehout for the incredible effort on his uh, part because I think if one person can make a difference, this is an example. But go ahead if you want to say a few words. Um, I'm Hannah Kopelman and I am the face of .NYC. I live in Washington Heights and it is a very diverse community, especially since it's been added as a neighborhood that has cheap rents. So we have a whole influx of a diverse population coming in, many of them artists, and who are into the cultural scene. I think .NYC would go very far to help us to connect everyone together, to bring all the resources to a central place, and to show people what is available, even if you don't have a computer or access to the internet in your own home, as so many residents do. So I just wanted to bring it home that it's not a theory that we would be fine stewards of .NYC, but that we have very practical issues that we are trying to conquer that hit us in our, you know, where we live, literally. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Councilmember Coppell may have questions, but if you could just des describe the process for obta obtaining a top-level domain. In other words, I can meet, I, there's an RFP, the city of New York is involved. There are many, many steps. If you could just describe the process. Well, I, this morning I, I asked Mike the timing on the ICANN's RFP, and he pulled out his uh, iPod or whatever it was and showed me a, a little thing, which I barely read. So if, if I may, uh, he's, Mike, Mike was a former board member of ICANN and is quite familiar with the process. And, my name is Mike Pelage, and I've uh, served uh, as an advisor t uh, with Tom over the. Uh, there we go. Thank you very much. Over the last uh, two years, shortly after stepping down from the ICAM board in 2006, um, I can. Uh, there we go. I can last night uh, issued a communication that within the next two weeks the draft RFP would be out in advance of the Cairo meeting. Uh, this communication is calling for a 45-day public comment period, um, and uh, they are predicting that the final RFP will be issued um, sometime early in 2009. As part of the policy development process, um, there was a four-month hard code date in the PDP, or the policy development process, which states that after the RFP is finalized, there will be four months for interested applicants to come forward and get their application. So right now um, uh, in Washington, approximately two weeks ago, uh, Paul Toomey, the CEO of ICANN, anticipated the applic 
application phase beginning at the end of the second quarter 2009. Now also of importance and direct relevance to a, a, a .NYC application was a communication which Mr. Toomey sent to the Government Advisory Committee, which represents over 100 governments that participate within ICANN. And in this communication that was sent out about approximately two weeks ago, there were specific guidelines relating to geographical identifiers, i.e. city TLDs. And um, these were recommendations that were, if you will, uh, new. They were not originally contemplated in any of the policy development process. So this was, um, if you will, ICANN staff initiating um, a deviation um, from what the community had said in response to concerns voiced by the governments. And what is, re what is relevant there was that with regard to city identifiers, there is basically going to be a requirement that the city approve, acknowledge show their support or acknowledge that they do not object so that there is um, th this is important um, and again this goes to kind of the foresight in uh, uh, chairperson for calling this uh, hearing because th we didn't even know this existed and just two weeks ago we found out that this new requirement is going to be there showing some type of uh, affirmative role in the city um, uh, to approve or uh, in the application process. So I think that is, is, is very relevant. Now, assuming that the applications begin to be, uh, are processed um, at the end of the second quarter, 2009, you're probably looking at around a 12 to 18 month window before that TLD will actually be up and operational in the route and resolving on the internet. Um, so I think that's kind of, if you will, important benchmarks and metrics um, to take into account. Um, the, the one thing, though, that I, I did want to touch, uh, touch upon and circle back on some of Tom's original comments is the governance structure. The governance structure is something that I, I bring a lot of expertise. I have worked with a number of registries over the years, .info, .coop, .mobi, .asia, and .post. I've dealt with for-profits, non-profits, cooperatives. I've dealt with IGOs, intergovernmental organizations, which have their own nuances with privileges and immunities. So. What is important here, and uh, which was very important, is a final governance structure has not been agreed upon. And the reason it has not been agreed upon is these consultations with the relevant community and the relevant stakeholders need to continue to continue. Now, what is what has become clear is that the governance structure will include certain variables. Obviously, the city council has a role in ensuring that public policy is properly incorporated into the operation of this TLD, which is going to represent the city's interest. Now, how that representation, whether it's direct or indirect, these are some of the things I think we need to look at. Um, another, uh, another definite variable will be NYC and company. Clearly they have a role in promoting tourism and trade within the city and they need to have a role particularly with some of the more generic um, or commonly used identifiers, hotels, tourism and stuff like that. So putting all these pieces together is something that hopefully as a result of this hearing and continued outreach we'll be able to figure out what the appropriate um, uh, interlocking mechanisms will be. It's also important in, in doing this that one acknowledge that launching a, two, launching a TLD is not for the faint of heart. Um, over the years, there have generally been litigation involved with certain aspects of expanding the namespace, either through processes or through individual specific applications. So that's one of the reasons why in setting uh, the proposal to have a nonprofit, it was designed to, if you will, insulate either city council or other nonprofits such as uh, NYC and company from having their operational budgets negatively impacted because particularly in the current economic situations, you wanna make sure that the existing budgets are going towards focusing on achieving their primary goals and you do not want this potential asset to become a distraction. So again, from a liability standpoint, 
Um, American lawyers have ways of complicating things, so I think that is uh, one of the things, looking back at the history of the launch of new TLDs, that one always must factor in from a governance structure. Thank you very much, Mike, for all of your knowledge. The other question I have is twofold. One is um, the um, ICANN is going to be looking at, I assume, many, many applications. So when you say the RFP, is that going to cover every kind of possible application, the one that's coming in after Cairo? Yes. They're, they, what they have done is, in the communication sent last night, there is going to be six components to the RFP, and that will cover geographical identifiers, corporate identifiers, such as a .IBM or a .comcast. Um, it, it, yes, this is designed to be a comprehensive, uh, one-size-fits-all RFP. Okay, and so when you were listening to the addendum, so to speak, that the staff came up with, I assume that the executive branch and the legislative branch, where there's some kind of geographic would have to be involved or wasn't clear? In other words, would the mayor's office and the city council have to sign off on something locally or wasn't clear from the addendum? Uh, I don't have that right in front so of me, but generally what ICANN is looking for, and again, looking back at when I sat on the board, we dealt with a situation with the .cat. TLD, which was for the T Catalan community. And what ICANN did there is working in conjunction with the uh, Government Advisory Committee, reached out to the relevant governments in the Catalan community to seek agreement or non-objection. So again, ICANN in this process is not trying to be overly rigid or inflexible, but just making sure that there are appropriate pol public policy safeguards so that one could not somehow dupe a city in trying to, if you, if you will, uh, have a city without the approval. And just one other, one other point is um, there is a recognition that there are some cities that may, in fact, be related to a generic term. Um, Orange, Moby, these are, there are some cities that actually have a generic term. So what ICANN has said is if someone comes forward and proposes, oh, I want to use this in a generic sense, I'm not intending to use it as a city, there will actually be requirements and safeguards to make sure that that entity does not change its mind later on at a later date and try to sort of, you know, get cute with the rules. So um, I think ICANN has, um, in, in this communication to the Government Advisory Committee, shown a, a rather broad brushstroke to provide that adequate safety net for public policy concern. Okay. Tom, you want to Yes. I, I just, you know, one of the concerns that I saw in the, in the recent letter from the president of ICANN, Paul Toomey, to the GAC, the Government Advisory Committee, was that, you know, in the instance where there are more than one application from a city, uh, that, uh, that, that they would, in the exa for example, let's say we were to, the council were to say connecting that NYC was a, a great model, and NYC and company decided that they wanted to, uh, uh, to apply also. Uh, they would put the two parties in touch with one another, period. That's it. You know, so in that instance, you know, I don't know what competing parties there might be, but if the city is not clear on its role and the fact that they want this thing to be developed, this thing can sit around for weeks, months, years, or decades before it, uh, it moves ahead. Meanwhile, other cities truly have their act together. Barcelona knows what they're doing. Uh, Berlin knows what they're doing. Paris knows what they're doing. And uh, I think New York does, too, but we just have to continue along and, and not, uh, uh, you know, confuse the situation. Okay. Um, how would the, in your scenario, or maybe looking at some other cities, how would domain names be allocated? I know you talked about Joe's Pub. I mean, I think obviously one would look at, in conjunction with places like NYC and Company, economic development, small business, things that have uh, known to the small business community, the tourism community, et cetera, something that is New York City based. But again, would that have an icon kind of definition, or would that be a local definition? And then how would somebody challenge uh, a domain name allocation? Uh, I'll answer this. Um, historically, looking back over the last seven years, ICANN has developed two types of TLDs. There's the, there's the sponsored and unsponsored. Uh, examples of sponsored would be .museum, .coop, .arrow, in those instances where the TLD is a sponsored TLD, ICANN delegates to that registry operator certain policy uh, 
delegation and authority. So, for example, the .mobi TLD, which is a, a joint venture with uh, uh, Nokia, Microsoft, right. and uh, Google, what they have done is they have actually hard-coded into the registration terms certain requirements regarding how a website on a .mobi appears so that it appears within a, uh, a, a narrow mobile handheld device. So there are certain restrictions. Um, an example with Dot Museum, there they are they are able to exclude who can and cannot do this. So, although in this new process, ICANN has not said there will be sponsors, there won't be sponsors. The belief um, in most of the community is that one can claim that they are seeking to represent a community. There should be a sponsored structure, and then that way that entity will be able to retain certain policy delegation authority. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember de Blasio has questions. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you, Chair Brewer. I think this is a, a important topic, and I want to uh, put my name on your uh, resolution. Um, it seems to me this fits uh, very clearly with the discussions we've had before about how to you know, create wireless access for the city and... Um, and how to look at the interplay of, you know, democracy and technology. And so I, I think of, uh, a lot of us in the council, and obviously Chair Brewer in particular, have been pounding away on this issue that uh, there is a fundamental democracy question in how we decide going forward um, what power people have in this process. So I really appreciate uh, that folks are raising the question of how do we allow people to get their information out, their message out, their brand out, their idea out, more effectively. I know everyone, myself included, has been frustrated by trying to get a name that's appropriate <laughs> and finding all avenues blocked, including names you would have thought no way on earth could have been taken already. And then, of course, there's the dynamic of uh, the sort of uh, unfortunate bidding war that occurs in trying to get names that are, you know, entrepreneurially owned by someone already. And we've certainly seen that in a lot of, uh, in business and in politics. So I guess I'm, I want to key in on the question of who should take the lead? And you talk about, I don't know who put this in their testimony about raising specifically the money questions and the entity question, but I'm very intrigued by the notion of the city directly doing this. And again, I think it keys into a lot of what Gail's been talking about in terms of wiring the city and using the Philadelphia example and one thing or another. So I, I want to ask it this way. Why shouldn't the city of New York step in and control .nyc and create an equitable fashion for uh, for allocating uh, ownership of each name. I I believe. Yeah, I I tried to address this. At I'm sorry. Oh no no, no. And, and put it this way, it's a very good point and worth revisiting. One of the things um, in my involvement with TLDs, with new TLDs in the 2000 and the 2004 round, has been um, a certain amount of litigation um, has generally involved the rollout of new TLDs. So in creating the appropriate governance structure, um, one of the things that I'm looking for is to insulate the TLD from undue litigation. So if this, if this city was to have a direct role, which if it wants, it could have that role. But once it does, it then begins to, if you will, create potential certain constitutional challenges. For example, um, some people um, in this room here have uh, are, are familiar with certain constitutional challenges regarding free speech that were raised back in the uh, late 90s regarding the expanse of the namespace. So by setting up the nonprofit, you have the ability to delegate certain policy, important public policy considerations to the city or appropriate policy bodies. So you have that safety net that you're looking for, but then not exposing the city council or the city to litigation involved in the day-to-day -day administration of the TLD. I, I respect that, and I understand the logic. I'm, uh, let me just make a counterpoint and ask you to comment, and I'll preface by saying I think in this last month or two, we've been given probably in my lifetime the most profound lesson on why the government has to play a role, um, a mediating role in public life and in the economy. Uh, and, and I'm sort of at a point personally very unapologetic now about saying I'm, I have no longer any doubt about government as the arbiter uh, because I don't trust the private sector to do it. And, and I think the stock market situation just kind of, to me, 
makes that point so clearly across the board. So you could say, well, you'd set up a nonprofit. I understand it, but I still fear that um, if, if I, mean, I guess I have two things. I fear if it's outside the hands of government, it will get in some way derailed or sent into a track where it won't be effective. And second of all, I feel like it's the same point about you know wiring the city and, and creating access that it should be. What, why on earth shouldn't it be the appropriate role of government? I'm not saying it might not be complicated. There might not be cost. There might not be considerations about you know distraction, if you will, of having to sort of have another front we have to act on. But I guess on a philosophical level, um, it to me sounds very similar to the argument of you know that we certainly heard in the hearings on creating a wireless city that you know a lot of folks were trying to urge us away from the government stepping in and making sure there was equity, and I fear those arguments. I think I think in fact the, the answer should be until you can prove there's a better way, it should be government's responsibility to make sure there is equity in everything involving technology and everything involving the internet. So what do you say to that? Can I, can I, as, as I said in the governance structure, the city, the city has a definite role. So this is not a question of do they have a role, they have a role. The question is in what, what role do they play? in the governance structure. So um, in looking at how things have been done before, let's look at the example of .edu, right? What .edu is a TLD, that's a legacy TLD that many people are very familiar with. It's a small TLD, only 7,000. That TLD, the United States government, actually delegated that to a private entity called EduCause because they thought that they would be able to do a better Is it a nonprofit or a pub or a? That is a nonprofit. EduCause is a nonprofit. So again. I'm sorry, with a government charter or some imprimatur? Uh, the government issued, I believe there was an RFP. There was a process where the, the United so States. So government government authorized. They, they authorize that. Yes, that's part of the legacy. .edu has its own little unique point. But in that instance, the government said, look, we want a private entity to, to run this. So I, I would think that that's probably one of the, a, a good example. You could also look at .org. .org is a, is, a, is a TLD that has upwards of 8 million names. That has been delegated to PIR, which is the registry operator. That's a 501c3, and ISOC is another 501c3. So they delegated that. Money goes back. So there are ways to set up governance structures to retain this. And getting back to your uh, concern, a very, lit a, a very legitimate concern regarding oversight, the city council always has the ability, NYC, uh, connecting NYC is a nonprofit. You have the ability to pass legislation So uh, as a city council to control. So if you feel, if you if you feel that the adequate safeguard mechanisms and the governance structure do not address your concerns, you, as a city council, you clearly have the ability to pass laws to address those concerns if, in fact, uh, they're, they're not addressed in the existing structure. Uh, I don't want to interrupt Gail. I just I have a follow up on for you. I just want Tom. Do you want to jump in on that quickly? Because I know yeah, I, I just you know then, when no. we started this thing in, in 2005. Uh, or 2003, rather, uh, you know, we, we approached the city government. I tried my best to get into City Hall and encourage city to, uh, uh, to send in an application. There were more important things that City Hall uh, had on their mind at that point. Uh, and I started in, in 2005 again, and, and I found the same difficulty. I couldn't find organizations that were interested in this. And I said, most important to me is that, that New York City have a, a top-level domain. I knew that Berlin was applying for it. I knew that other cities were going to apply for it. Tom, are they applying directly or through a nonprofit, or you don't know? Uh, it, it differs. In, uh, in Berlin, it, it's a nonprofit, nonprofit, uh, a nonprofit in, um, uh, in, uh, in Barcelona. I believe it's going to be government going to create a, a for-profit uh, with, with adequate uh, supervisory role to operate it. So it's always outside of government, but the so the idea was to make sure that that the thing would be that it would get done. You know that that it didn't happen last time. I wanted to make sure that this opportunity was not lost. So uh, so I started this uh, not for profit with the intention of getting city government involved as much as I could. And you, you have know? a meeting with them now. Uh, 
I, I have a meeting with. So you have been meeting with. I have now. a meeting. I met with Dewitt. I, I met with all with my council members, with with everybody that I could get get a, a hold of, saying, you know, we want you involved with this. You know, we think that we can focus on the issue. That you know that you know NYC and company might be a, a reasonable one to do it. They'll be interested in half a dozen of these, and and they should, and they should develop them, and we'll make sure they get them. We met with Dewitt, and we said, you know, NYC.gov. Uh, gov.myc is for the city of New York. They said, well, we don't want to use it now. It's reserved for you, you know. Our intention is to involve, we met with the Queens Borough President. She said she wants all the borough presidents on the board. We'd love to have the borough president. Okay, I'm, I'm going to interrupt. I apologize. I just want to follow up because I feel like there's something hanging in the air I need to get at here. Um, I, I, okay, I respect the answer, obviously, but uh, I'm not hearing sort of the why not enough. And the, one of the things I'd like to point to is I think the N dot .myc is going to be unquestionably more popular than, say, dot .edu, because I think it has such broad, you know, application. And I, get, I think in one of the testimony pointing out how powerful it would be as a promotional tool for people to make clear that that was their brand, that was their location simultaneously. Um, but also on the legal front, if you're trying to ensure equity and trying to not let lawsuits bog you down, I would think having a government entity defending would give you more chance of success than a nonprofit, even a nonprofit with government support, um, just because of the sheer weight and the you know the legal ability and the, every, and the way government treats other government in the legal process. So I, I'm not I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm trying to understand why it isn't superior to have it based in government. If you and again, I, this is a, this is the excellent dialogue, and there there may not be a right answer. There could just be different viewpoints. If you look at the U.S. government, right, the whole idea, because it, there was a certain point in time, the green paper, the white paper, the whole genesis of ICANN was to get the U.S. out of the U.S. government out of the direct control of the namespace. That's why they created NUCO, which was ICANN, a nonprofit corporation, to, if you will, handle the day-to-day -day administration. Now, although ICANN is handling the day-to-day -day administration, the oversight that you are concerned about is still maintained through two agreements, the IANA agreement and the uh, JPA, the Joint Project Agreement. So what the U.S. government has been doing is letting the nonprofit ICANN handle the general administration of the, the, the global coordinating role while retaining its oversight through separate agreements. So again, getting back to your concern, does the city council does the city have, does it have a role? Yes, it has a role. So it's, it, it's just a matter of how do you enforce the role and the concerns? So I guess my question to you is, what do you fear? What are your concerns uh, of what, what could go wrong? I think right now uh, we see a growing uh, skew in everything involving the Internet along the lines of money and resources. Um, as I said, you know, you, you want a name that's the perfect name for you, you're going to have to pay for it and that immediately take, and pay you know, if someone else has grabbed it entrepreneurially and then they'll sell it, sell it to the highest bidder, um, which is happening rampantly. Um, you know, and that would be true, obviously, if you came up with .nyc, it would instantly have people running all over trying to grab all the, the good names. And I think what it means is it kind of goes against, again, everything that Gail and this committee has been talking about is about equity and access. And so if you keep repeating the pattern we've had up to now, which although I appreciate the history and it's, it's government um, sponsored in a sense, it still seems to me to slowly but surely fall into the worst habits of the private sector where it becomes about who has the most resources, who has the most lawyers, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and let me, let me address that concern. I was just talking about .mobi, where they have hard-coded in user guides, certain specific requirements. Dot, .biz is a uh, unsponsored restrictive TLD. And one of the one of the requirements that they have in there is there is a requirement that the use of that domain name there must be a bona fide commercial use. So cyber squatting or someone just holding out a name to prevent a legitimate business. These are restrictions that have been hard coded into the registrant agreement that are enforced via contract. So if the council has legitimate concerns on the allocation process, 
if that's what they want to do. The way to do this is through a policy council that will set the registration use and terms. So if you if you want to sit there and set specific equitable guidelines on how names are used and how they're allocated, you even have the ability, there are some registries that, pre- that prevent the resell of names. So if you are concerned about a cyber squatter getting a name and then trying to resell it to the highest bidder to the detriment of uh, of, a, of a business, um, there are ways to address that. Um, now, one of the most important ways that I think we're going to prevent the, if you will, the commercial, the the pirating or the profiteering of this space is by having the strict um, uh, registrant requirements, geographical requirements as to who could register. So I think that's number one. If you're just limiting it to people within New York City, and this is when we had met with Paul Gos, uh, with uh, the Cosgrove. Commission Cosgrove, yes. Cosgrove. Thank you for, from Do It. Um, they were very, very concerned about making sure that there were strict um, geographical uh, guidelines, a verification, so that um, someone from you know Jersey City, you know, no, you're not a New Yorker, you don't apply. So by restricting it to New Yorkers, that's going to be one of the that's going to be one of the most important safeguards to minimize profiteering. You then could have the ability to limit how many names a person could have historically. Historically, for example, there have been some registries, .ca just comes to mind, where you could only have one or two TLDs uh, or domain names. So you can be, these are different policy mechanisms that I, I think the way to go about this is everything that you have raised are all excellent points from an equity standpoint and making sure that the use of this TLD provides a maximum benefit to the citizens. What what I guess my question, I'm, I guess my rebuttal to you is: there are ways of doing that through a policy body where you have council members sitting and direct oversight, and to do that, and then have that feedback to the nonprofit, so that you have that insulation from a liability standpoint, but still have that important public policy safeguard and, if you will, the short leash, so that if you see the nonprofit acting in an inconsistent way, you have the ability to pull back the leash. Let me, I'm sorry to jump in. The, uh, I don't want to prolong it. I'll just say this. I appreciate your answers very much. The, the fundamental question, I think, look, we've had a very strange uh, national situation in the last eight years in terms of civil liberties, in terms of information flow, um, things, and uh, you'll see where this goes. I mean, uh, uh, one of the things that really grabs me is for decades and decades and decades, it was assumed that the media would show you the tragedy of the bodies of soldiers returning to this country, and then somehow it was blacked out when this particular war in Iraq began, and it's never happened. So what that says to me is, you know, something could be well established as a concept of freedom of information and journalistic practice, and suddenly it can be compromised, which means anything can be compromised. You don't have to be a conspiracy theorist to realize how, you know, money and power and everything else can change the flow of information. That being said, um, when this committee started talking about ensuring real access, you know, you saw all sorts of people come out of the woodwork trying to inhibit the notion of the city playing a role in doing that. Um, and, and all sorts of fears raised, even though there's examples of other cities playing a very, and other governmental entities playing an aggressive and effective role. My fear is whenever you take it a few steps away from our immediate ability to control and oversee it, it gets lost in the confusion of things, it's harder to affect change. Yeah, you could have people on a board, but that's still several steps. You know, you have to identify a problem and then get to a solution and move a solution through an indirect process, whereas if something under our direct oversight, uh, in my opinion, there's more chance of at least getting a public debate on it. So I, I don't want to belabor. I'm just trying to give you a flavor of why, to me, when I hear this particular vein, I see a lot of things in society going the wrong way in terms of you know democratic process and free of information. So on this one, I'd say, how do we put a higher level of guarantee, and can you do that if it's not directly overseen by a legislative body? And and and, and I think this is a good constructive dialogue. And my response, you, again, this is just a free flow of information. One potential way of getting that if you will, the nuclear option of what happens when you have a rogue nonprofit or because that's what you're really concerned with. What happens when you have a rogue 
nonprofit or a rogue registry operator that is no longer responsive to the city council's concern, their public policy trust has been violated. One potential way, and again, this is just a dialogue here, is based upon the most recent RFP where you have to have the affirmative approval of the, 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 of the relevant city government, perhaps you look at incorporating that safeguard into the actual registry agreement so that any time that the city, the city has the ability to say when the application was put forward, we gave them the support, we, we believed in them, and at any point in time when that trust has been violated, the city has the ability to contact ICANN and say, well, then it's a very short leash, and I'm, not, I'm less worried about a rogue nonprofit than a nonprofit overwhelmed by the, the, the power and legal teams of corporations who want to buy up a lot of names and, you know, and, and use them for whatever reason. The, um, I think if you say to me there's a very short leash, I'm more intrigued then that uh, you know, there's almost a trigger mechanism. If something inappropriate happens, there's a very specific remedy and a specific way, for example, their charter is revocable under these conditions or whatever. So you know, I, I am talking from a broad construct, but I would urge as the committee considers it going forward that we push for you know, a very clear, sharp safeguard so that if something isn't working, we have the ability to pull it back. Thank you, Mr. Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, along those lines, I know that when I spoke to do it, I know they're not able to be here today, but I, I was very, very clear just picking up on this. If there was one aspect of this that I felt most strongly about is that whether it's government or nonprofit, New York City should not be participating in supporting a for-profit to be the oversight of this particular um, Project. So that was something that I think in the comment period, uh, all of us individually or collectively as a committee should be commenting. And these are great, great points to add to the comment period. We've been joined by Councilmember James Sanders, who is from the borough of Queens. Um, I think one other question that we didn't get a complete answer, depending on what happens, because this is still very theoretical, nothing's been applied for, but what would be the process locally if we had the structure that you were envisioning of challenging a domain name allocation. Is that something that's too far-fetched to even discuss at this point? Because I think the issue is it's not just rogue, it's also are you a New Jersey firm or are you a New York firm and one person says one thing, another person says another. This, this has been addressed, um, for example, I, I'll refer back to the .biz TLD. Um, they actually have a, a, a use challenge requirement. So all ICANN TLDs have a requirement that they comply with what they call the UDRP, the Uniform Dispute Resolution Policy. And that is addressed at providing minimal safeguards for trademark owners. So that, that is in every GTLD. On top of that, you as a registry operator can impose other use terms of use, and that's exactly what the .biz TLD has done. They have, that is where the bona fide use requirement. Another example which I think would be re very relevant for the city to look for would be the .us TLD that has specific a, 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 a nexus requirement for the registrant. So the ability to cancel a registration because uh, certain geographic nexus requirements have not been met, that is totally within the scope an authority that a .nyc would be able to have, the ability to draft these mechanisms. There are already numerous mechanisms out there that could be easily modeled or adapted to address the concerns. Who actually council. runs the .us? Who decides if you are a U.S.? What dot, the, the .us TLD has been delegated by the NTIA, Department of Commerce, mm -hmm to Newstar. So Newstar is the registry operator. And Newstar is a 501c3? No, they are a for-profit entity. They are a publicly traded company. Newstar, what Newstar does is they contract out, there are, mul I believe there are at least two providers that neutral third-party dispute providers that if someone believes um, uh, that the nexus requirement has not been met or the bona fide use of uh, business use has not been met, that third party has the ability to file a complaint with one of these uh, agencies. In this situation, as part of the government, uh, the the New York City Council maintaining it, you can impose. It would, that be, the, it would be the go city government. You, you you could have someone imposing. You could do, do that internally, um, Chamber of Commerce. There are different. There are the 
flexibility to address your concerns, I believe, can easily incorporate it in any uh, administrative dispute process. So one would assume that Newstar makes quite a bit of money, but those that are running the EDU and the .org, which are nonprofits, are plowing it back into their project. In other words, those are both. It's, it's just interesting for those of us standing on the side here. Some are for-profit models. Some are non-profit models. Some are cooperative. Some are intergovernmental. There, okay. there is an infinite spectrum. And how spectrum. much? There's obviously a, a lots of economic advantages. Do you have some kind of a estimate on the economic impact on something like this? Obviously, what is of, of great importance is somebody from the city or from any place in the world that says .NYC because it has such cachet, people are going to think better of that company or that institution. So that would be the economic advantage. How much also money do you think would be involved, $100,000 or some six-figure to set this thing up? But it, it, would part of the RFP be how much you would charge somebody to have a .NYC? So two issues here. One is economic development, one is the... I will leave Tom talk to economic development. Okay. Um, with regard to cost, the... Cost and revenue. Cost and revenue. It, not to sound like a lawyer, but it depends. Okay, no, I understand. And, and and let Just me from past experience. exactly. So let me give you some snapshots here. There is the dot co-op, which yes. is a small TLD, six thousand names. One person runs that. that is there is dot cat, which has I believe two people. Now these are administration. They subcontract out the back end. Okay, so we're just talking about administration. Dot cat has two people that manage thirty thousand names. Dot org has approximately ten people eight to ten people that manage upwards of eight million names. Got it. Okay. Dot uh, Asia has two, a quarter of a million, and I believe they have a staff of five. So there are, are, are a variety of different uh, staffing requirements that go towards, if you will, the, the cost side. We, what we don't know is we don't know what the application, as Tom said, it's probably going to be a six-digit fee. Um, the ongoing application costs, as far as that, there is generally going to be a per domain name fee. Mm -hmm. Now, what could be impacted is there's two different ways to look at domain name allocations that Tom and I have discussed. Clearly, businesses should be paying for their domain name. Mm -hmm. However, you may want to create a situation to create a social network where individual New Yorkers might be able to have a domain Main name for free, sort of like a MySpace or something like that, a, uh, a social network. You well, if, if I you have just trouble in the making, but go ahead. Well, but but then, uh, as I said, if if you want to something to discuss. Well, well, this yeah, is exactly this is well, this is exactly it from a cost structure and a revenue structure. Because do you just want to charge names? If you're generally going to charge, you're generally going to be looking at businesses and some really uh, proud people. Now, it, as I said, if you want to give away names, and there are different incentives. One of the things I think you know we've talked about is if someone's registered to vote, they get a free name. So there, you're creating civic awareness, pride. They're actually registering to vote. Guess what? You get the ability to have a .dot NYC name. So there are different there are different constructs and you know part of what as I said Tom and I have discussed is until we understand what the governance structure is, you really can't build the business model. So they're kind of they go along in parallel here, but these are some of the things I think you need to look at and based upon that you then reverse engineer the business model. To what happens if you move? Okay, go ahead Tom. Go ahead, go ahead. I, that, uh, I, that's I, a, go obviously ahead. a difficult one. We've got our students in the city. You can't keep track of who's and, registered. And you, can, you, can take the, you should be able to take them with you. I mean, you can't start a business, have a good business in New York City as a consultant, for example, and leave the city and, uh, and not be able to take your business name with you. So, I mean, we, we can't restrict people in that regard. But we, we, can, we can be uh, strict in, in who gets them initially and in the types of sta the standards we set in terms, in terms of how you use it. You know, so if you don't, if you, if you don't have that... Names need to be renewed. Okay. They need to be renewed every two years. Right. And if, if there's I know a I use... pay my renewal, $35. I'm familiar with it. Yeah, well, it can be Gail cheaper. You should, you, should, you, should, uh, you should shop around. You could probably get some cheaper than <laughs> Thank that. Thank you, Tom. And the people in Berlin are thinking of charging $50. Uh, others are thinking of charging uh, $25 initially. Uh, you know, it, what the ICANN does with the RFP, what the city decides its involvement is going to be, there's a whole load of questions right. that we've got to answer as we get down the line here. But basically, we want to make sure that New Yorkers get these names, that it 
residents, that it's small businesses, that it's individuals in New York, and as much as possible to, to develop that. And, and once we have all New Yorkers having names and all New York's businesses having them, they'll be, it'll be a very desirable name. It'll be a good brand for our city. We'll put a good face out to the world. Would the assignment of names be first come, first serve at auction, or this is all to be discussed? I mean, this, well, these are very I, specific yeah. issues. I, I, I think that you know, we, we don't you know we don't have a until we have a uh, you know a, a more uh, diverse board. Uh, we we really not, haven't made any decisions on that. But the, the people in uh, the, they've learned how to do this over the years. You know, they've made a lot of mistakes with the dot biz and the dot info. The people with dot Asia have, have did a pretty good job with it. I mean, they have kind of figured out the order of distribution so that you know we we'd have certain names that we'd have to set aside for technical reasons. We'd have ones that we'd have for for our own internal corporate Absolutely. reasons. And, and then we'd we'd want to name the uh, the trademark people. They have certain rights. You know, if American Express dot NYC wants dot NYC, you know, they'll have a right. And then we're going to set aside what we what reason we're going to community boards is we're setting aside civic names and neighborhood names, you know, and we're not deciding how that's done at this point. We're just trying to identify all the neighborhood names in, in New York City. So, uh, for example, one of the ones that we found the other day and just raises an issue of how difficult this is, is that uh, there's a neighborhood in, in Brooklyn called Rugby. You know, I didn't know there was a neighborhood in Brooklyn called Rugby. And, you know, so there's going to be the neighborhood, you know, my inclination as a community board guy, you know, what I say, you know, Rugby should be, go, should, you know, the community board, communities should have their names, neighborhoods should have their names, you know, and come up with a process for the neighborhoods to decide that. But when you have rugby, you know, rugby versus rug, rugby is what my post was on, on the blog, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know how big the rugby community is in New York, but, you know, maybe you could share a page in that instance. Got know. it. Okay. Council Member Sanders, you had a question? No, just more of a statement, uh, Madam Chair. It, this sounds like a, a very good idea. I was thinking about um, the primary responsibility uh, seems that it would go through e EDC or some variation, Department of Small EDC more than anything else, um, to manage it. And of course, they would sub subcontract. But I, I think it's a great idea. Um, I can see it making money for the city at a time. Uh, when money will be necessary. Um, my first thought was not free, I must concede, um, but s certainly for charge and for the police department, dot NYC or some variation of this, um, I, can, I can see it. Thank you very Thank much. You. So I can think you can see that there's lots of discussion um, on our side of the aisle, so to speak. And people wondering, I think particularly because of what we're all facing in government, what the financial ramifications are, the process, um, the excitement on one hand, and then the concern on the other about how it's actually implemented. But I want to thank you, all three of you, for being pioneers. It takes one person, and you've done it. So thank you very much for your interest and your support, and we'll keep working with you. Thank, thank you very you much. So much. Appreciate it. All right. The next panel is um, Dr. Um, Franz Verhagen, Paul Garin, and Anthony Van Coovering. And this is the last panel. My name is uh, Dr. Franz Verhagen. I uh, reside in Rigo Park, 9737 63rd Road, Part 15E. And I'm a sustainability sociologist who is representing the New York City Earth Charter Alliance, abbreviated, abbreviated as NICEPAC. N sorry, NICE call. And <clears throat> I have uh, two comments to make an educational one and a taxonomic one. The educational one uh, is one of the reasons that I favor this uh, particular proposal. I had a uh, meeting with Tom a year, maybe two years ago, um, and um, saw the potential for educating the citizenry about not only about the internet and about <coughs> social networks, <coughs> sorry, inside the city and outside the city, but <coughs> also in terms of 
the larger kind of vision that we could uh, incorporate into this uh, TLD. And when I talk about the larger vision, I'm really sequencing into the taxonomic uh, part of my testimony. Taxonomic uh, taxonomy is basically a scientific enterprise to justify classifications. We all make classifications and we often don't think about it and so taxonomies are very subject to all kinds of personal and social biases. So <clears throat> for this major enterprise with all the questions that we heard about in this really good discussion, I uh, feel that as part of the application and of all the people who are going to participate in .NYC, that they start thinking not only about the present but also about the future. And when we say future in New York City, we really have to say Plan NYC 2030. Mayor Bloomberg's sustainability plan is there and though it has some real shortcomings, it is a very important first step. And so I for one, I would strongly recommend in the whole process that we look into the, to, into the future with this TLD and incorporate the YC 2030. Now, when I say shortcomings of YC 2030, I feel that given the whole process of this particular sustainability strategy, that there are shortcomings in terms of social justice, in terms of procedural justice, so the whole process. And so I, for one, I would recommend that we enrich YC 2030 with the integrated social and ecological values of the Earth Charter. Some of you may know about the Earth Charter. It's basically the successor, you might say, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the 20th century. It's also compared to the rights of man and citizen of 18th century Britain, if, or if, yeah, just, if and even the Magna Carta of, the, of 13th century Britain. Okay. So, in conclusion, I think this is an outstanding um, effort there's quite a few questions still left, but I would strongly recommend that we include the future in terms of YC2030 together with the values of the Earth Charter. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you for making time to be here today. Thank you. Go good, morning. Good, good morning. Uh, good morning. Name, good morning. And I want to thank the council for having this uh, hearing and for giving me the opportunity to present my uh, testimony uh, today. Um, I have a written testimony that I would like to submit to the record. It's in more detail. Um, I can give each uh, council member a copy. Okay. And first I want to also say that... Um, Introduce yourself. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, my name is, is Paul Guerin. Um, I am a longtime resident and a product of the New York City uh, education. Specifically, I graduated from the Cooper Union. In, uh, with a degree in fine arts in 1982. And uh, some people may know me uh, in a, from 20 years ago when uh, I was the cameraman who was assaulted by the police in Tompkins Square Park and was, uh, no, became known for exposing the cover-up there. Um, I'm also the uh, founder of an organization called Name.Space. And um, I want to just give a little history. First of all, um, the positive economic impact of the New York City domain could have been realized years ago had the efforts of Name.Space to bring new top-level domains not been blocked by big business. It's my hope that Name.Space will this time be supported by the city so that economic benefits of not only the NYC domain but hundreds of other top-level domains that Name.Space originated and published more than 10 years ago will make a positive impact on New York City's economy. 
Um, by not recognizing name.space top-level domains, ICANN has actually hurt New York City by not allowing one of its cutting-edge startup enterprises, namely my organization, name.space, to grow to its full potential to create jobs in New York City and enable commerce and opportunities for New Yorkers to contribute to the growth of our economy. Name.space has the potential to become a billion-dollar company that would generate millions of dollars that would flow into the New York City economy. Had ICANN recognized Name.Space in the year 2000, uh, when we had initially applied for .NYC among uh, over 118 other top-level domains, the positive impact would have already begun in, and the .NYC domain would already be widely in use and generating benefits for New York City and New Yorkers. Now, if I may, I just want to give a little background uh, because the history of the top-level domains uh, expansion did not start with ICANN. It actually started before ICANN. And uh, my organization, uh, Name.Space, is actually the uh, first proponent of a widely expanded top-level domain namespace. And in fact, uh, in 1995, just as the internet was becoming commercial, I had uh, downloaded and uh, reviewed the open source protocols that made the internet work. And when I realized that the domain name system was an essential service that helped people find their way online, and with my creative uh, background in arts and media, I began experimenting setting up domain name servers with partners all over the world, and we began to uh, create a new set of top-level domains, including .art, .nyc, dot music, dot love, dot space, dot shop, and a growing list of other useful generic terms that were suggested by people all over the world in response to a survey that we had on our uh, website. Um, we understood at that time, and I understood at that time, that the internet was going to become a booming commercial medium and that the demand for domains was going to be large and beyond what the so-called legacy domains of dot com, dot org, dot net could handle. And uh, so at the time, in 1996, 97, uh, when Name.Space was doing its technical development, uh, the domain registration process happened in bureaucratic time. It was an email-based application form. It sometimes took weeks to get a domain process, and the cost was around $100. Uh, Name.Space was actually, I can say this unequivocally, the very first to create a fully automated self-service domain name registry that would create a domain registration in real time and allow the domains registered to be available within 90 seconds of registration. Uh, we also uh, were the inventors of so-called Smart Who Is, which was the first of its kind domain search that would search any top-level domain or IP address from a single form. As a small startup, Name.Space confronted incredible barriers to entry trying to bring its domains to the greater market of the internet. Because top-level domains must be synced with a master database called the root, and because the master root.zone file was controlled and operated by a monopoly, at the time, Network Solutions Incorporated, Namespace Incorporated uh, was forced to file an antitrust suit, Namespace versus Network Solutions, and you can see that online at namespace.org law, on March 20th, 1997. Uh, when Network Solutions refused to include namespace top-level domains into the root. The, names, the lawsuit was litigated in the Southern District of New York Court, and it was modeled after the successful MCI versus AT&T that broke up the phone monopoly in the United States and brought competitive long-distance service. I wonder if you can just summarize some of your testimony. Um, it makes sense, but just if you could summarize it, and then I think it's helpful to have this in terms of the current discussion with ICANN, which is very helpful. Absolutely. I, I, I just, if you would, I just want I am actually summarizing it. All right, go but, ahead. That's uh, fine. You know, I would appreciate uh, a sure. reasonable amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, the result of the namespace uh, lawsuit, uh, let me see, I'm sorry about that. Um, anyway, the namespace uh, litigated its lawsuit, and in the year 2000, the U.S. Court of Appeals, Second Circuit, upheld the namespace antitrust claims, but granted Network Solutions immunity as a U.S. government contractor in an unprecedented decision. Meanwhile, while uh, uh, Namespace versus Network Solutions was being litigated and Namespace was anticipating a win under the law, the case was a winner to begin with. We didn't expect the Network Solutions to get immunity. 
the U.S. Department of Commerce set up uh, a, a contract between uh, the um, newly formed ICANN not-for-profit agency. Uh, all the while, since Namespace was first started in 1996, it was in business with a growing number of members who were registering under the Namespace top-level domains, uh, which supported our proof of concept. Now, this is before ICANN even came along. Um, we were told that, at the time, uh, that what we were doing could not and should not be done. In fact, Namespace, myself personally, was harassed, coerced, extorted, and a very vocal minority was spreading disinformation that what we wanted to do, namely add a large number of top-level domains to the root, and at the time we had come up with 540, including .nyc as a result of our survey, they said people were saying that it could not and should not be done, that it would cause chaos, and that it would break the internet. Now, I had contacted the DARPA scientist who invented the domain name system, Dr. Paul Makapetris, and he confirmed to me that the scalability of the domain name system as he designed it could accommodate millions of top-level domains into the root. However, he declined to be an expert witness on behalf of our case because he wanted to stay out of the politics. Had Dr. Makapetris' testimony been uh, part of our preliminary injunction in uh, March of 1998, uh, Namespace would have already prevailed. We would have basically put aside the judge's technological fears of the unintended consequences that what may happen with a large number of top-level domains, and we would have already brought our domains to market. Now, fast forward ahead uh, in the year 2000, uh, Namespace basically applied uh, to the ICANN round in the year 2000, and we paid a $50,000 application fee. Um, several of the ICANN board members at that time actually had to recuse themselves because they were involved with parties who were also domain applicants. And needless to say, those recused parties were all awarded the top-level domains, and they voted Namespace down. Although. Chairperson Esther Dyson, who was the chair of uh, ICANN at the time, was a supporter and did vote for Namespace's application. Um, Namespace, the application that we put before ICANN, uh, as far as we understand, is still pending. And in the next round, we're actually pleased that ICANN finally sees it our way and that a lot of, large number of top level domains is a good idea and a good thing for the internet. And um, so this time around, Namespace is going to reassert its application with ICANN. And of course, we will have the funding to handle whatever it takes to do that. And um, I'm actually quite pleased. Uh, I've been talking to Tom Lowenhop off and on for quite some time. Uh, Tom is also uh, well aware of my history and my efforts to bring on not only .NYC, but other top-level domains to the internet. And um, I actually uh, would look forward to not only uh, cooperating but working with Tom because I think his work in the government's governance structure is good. And I generally agree with the bulk of the discussion that has taken place this morning. Um, what I'm asking for, uh, first of all, is that uh, to put on the record that .NYC is actually uh, not anything that's new. It is actually uh, 12 years old. .NYC was originally created, first published by Namespace in 1996, and has been in continuous use in commerce since its date of inception in 1996. Okay. Uh, yep. So therefore, uh, name.space reserves its right to the .NYC domain, and uh, we are committed to applying the top-level domain .nyc as a civic purpose. And um, so, in short, uh, the .nyc is intended by name.space to serve New Yorkers and de is dedicated to a mission of social responsibility and civic purpose. Okay. You need to wrap up, sir. Just uh, I will. Really do uh, okay. Name.space intends to operate .nyc as a means to create funds to bring positive social and ecological change to New York City. Funds raised by .NYC beyond its operating and management costs will go into a fund for New Yorkers to help pay for uh, 
or provide outright communications and media services for New Yorkers with a focus on education and the young, okay. including free, child-friendly wireless broadband for all K-12 through students and a one-laptop-per-child program to help bridge the right. digital. I'm very familiar with all those issues. I wish they were so easy, but I really appreciate your testimony, and um, I think that this will be a long process. Certainly, as a result of the conversation today, it'll probably be even longer. But um, we appreciate your input, and it's good, to, it's good to know that you've been involved this long time. Okay. Well, one final point that I would like to make. Because okay. I really, yeah, go ahead. Yes, I, I just, understand. I but have, we I have also, to move along. Also, the first presenters had quite a lot of time. I know, I, because he's been working on this for a very long time. I've been working on this actually okay. Sir, longer. Sir, we really need to move on. So if you want to conclude, that's fine. But we need to move yes, on. Yes, in conclusion, uh, Name that Space has the potential to raise an incredible amount of money because not only .NYC, but uh, scores of other top-level domains. Uh, should we succeed in acquiring them, the global recognition for them, will create a very large uh, employer in our organization and will generate a large amount of money for the New York economy. Thank you very much. This is the next one. Anthony Van Kuring is next. <clears throat> Welcome. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Councilwoman Brewer, and um, everybody else left. But was everybody else, staff. Great I, I can't staff. read without my glasses. I can't see. <laughs> so my name is Anthony Vancouvering. Um, I've been a New Yorker for over 30 years, and I've been working to create a dot NYC since the year 2000. Um, I bring with me Davidson Golden, uh, who's been advising me on how best to... We know him. We like him. Good. That's good to hear. <laughs> make this good for New Yorkers. New York One, yes. Right. And I've been meeting many times with Tom Lowenhaupt in an effort to bring our two plans together. Um, as you've heard earlier, ICANN's about to authorize uh, new top-level domains, finally fulfilling its mission. That's what it was created for. And I know that because uh, I chaired the meeting that created ICANN's General Assembly, which is the mm -hmm. place where people come right. to talk about. My partner, uh, Bill Semek, was there as well. We've both been working in the domain name industry since 1997. Um, combined, we've started five country code top-level domains, and Bill has pioneered a public-private profit-not-for-profit model for geographically based top-level domains that's been copied worldwide and has brought free internet access to an entire country. Uh, he's a board member of .Asia as well. Personally, I've started three different domain name companies and sold them to publicly traded companies, and that's my experience mostly. In 2000, we filed an application with ICANN for .NYC, which we uh, then withdrew as the dot-com bubble burst. And in 2004, we almost filed again, but ICANN was, seemed set on approving just a few TLDs, so we thought the time was not right. But now, we have London, Paris, Boston, Berlin, Chicago, Hamburg, Munich, Toronto, Tokyo, Barcelona, Portland, all going to apply for a, a new top-level domain. So New York must not be left behind. It is a global city, and it needs to assume its proper rank in, the, in that uh, list. So after 10 years, the time is right. But there's a risk. Dot travel didn't work. Dot arrow didn't work. Dot museum didn't work. Dot pro didn't work. Why? Because very few people had ever heard of these TLDs, because they were tangled up in bad rules and policy, and because they weren't administered well. And we cannot afford that with .NYC. Uh, for .NYC to succeed, people need to know about it. That will not happen all by itself. Uh, it needs a real marketing campaign, an awareness campaign. People need to know that it exists. They need to know how to get it. And they need to know how they can use it. And it also needs to be run professionally and competently. And this will require an investment. Uh, we estimate in the millions of dollars, especially for the marketing side. Build it and they will come is just not a good business model for a new top-level domain. .NYC needs to be responsive to the needs of New York and New Yorkers. Uh, the community partner model that we've pioneered is now used worldwide. It works well. A generous 
percentage of profits are taken off the top and given to a not-for-profit group who has the understanding of how to disperse it and the authority from the city to disperse it where the community needs it. It's not our job to decide that. That leaves the operating company to focus on, with its expertise on making .NYC work. While the community partner uses the proceeds for the community, brings community feedback uh, to make sure that we're being responsive. Uh, obviously this could be, this is an amorphous group, it's not us to decide who it is either. Um, our plan provides for free names for New York City agencies, which they propose, which they will propose. Um, it makes sure that New Yorkers know about .NYC. Um, it makes sure that important names are reserved for community use. Uh, it makes sure that New Yorkers get a first crack at the good names. Uh, it doesn't require, our plan does not require that the city put up any money. In fact, we generate money for the city. Our plan discourages the warehousing of domain names through stipulations for use. Our plan fi fights spam, phishing, and other illegal activities. With our plan, .NYC will be a professional, well-run, and responsive organization. Um, as you've pointed out, ICANN is a public-private partnership, and we believe that this model works for .NYC as well. We have a detailed presentation that we're happy to make available to any interested party and we're happy to meet with you as well. Uh, but in the interest of time, I'm just making a few remarks. Um, and uh, again, thank you, Tom, for uh, doing this. And it's an effort we've been involved in for a long time and uh, we hope it goes forward. Thank you very much. Um, Anderson, you want to add anything? Uh, I just, you know, on um, their Why behalf. Why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Davidson Golden. In addition to other ways that I, I know the committee chairwoman and some of her colleagues, I've been advising Anthony and his partners on making sure, as they've been determined to all along, that they work with the city, the council, other non-governmental entities in, in a way that is best for everybody. Because as, as Anthony said, their job will be to run .NYC, where the money that they generate goes is for the people, elected officials, and their colleagues in government to decide um, best. Uh, where they stand now is they've been meeting with several um, prominent non-governmental organizations and other entities that are associated with the city, meetings with Do It, and the law department are in progress, uh, meeting with you, obviously, something we've begun to discuss, and after the current round of other issues that is, are focusing on people's time. Um, They'd like to do that. Uh, and I, I just also should add, I was a little surprised to hear Mr. Lowenhaupt say that he didn't know the other people interested in, in, in doing this and who are quite further along because I've been present for a conversation between um, Anthony and, and Tom. And I know that the goal um, on Anthony's behalf is to work um, with Tom. He has terrific community ideas and his concept of what the community needs. Um, he's got a lot of good ideas. He just doesn't have the means to do this. Um, this team... Um, is ready to go, and hopefully there's a way for everybody to come together, as they've been discussing, and actually make this happen. And just to anticipate if your colleague, Mr. de Blasio, were here, some of the questions he would ask. The, the plan, as you'll see, provides for a very robust role for government. Uh, government's uh, assent, as you know, is required for any plan to move forward. And um, for this to happen, everybody's got to be on the same page. And I'd, I'd be happy to speak to some of the policy issues that you raised earlier, if, you, if indeed you have time. Uh, and if not, um, I'm happy oh, to be able to Oh, what do you think about, I mean, there's a nonprofit model, there's a government model, there's a for-profit model, there's an integration of all of them model. What, what do you think about all of that? Well, I, I've seen there are a number. Uh, are you for-profit or non-profit? We're not... for-profit. Okay. But we have a not-for-profit wing. Okay. And that is a, that's a model that has worked well overseas. Um, we've seen a lot of uh, CCTLDs that started out um, along the lines that were discussed here, which is to say uh, basically run by a government or uh, some agency of a government um, with strict uh, rules that were pre-applied before anyone could get a name. So in other words, in in France, you had to be a business, you had to be on their list of businesses. If you applied, they would check that out, and then if you got it, you would get the name. So what happened there is that nobody used .fr. 
Reason being, uh, International Business Machines, Inc. didn't want their name to be International Business Machines, Inc.fr. They wanted to be IBM. Well, that's not their name on the registry. Um, those models are very, very costly because somebody has to go, uh, in the example that was used earlier, uh, go through the voter rolls. Um, <laughs> Joe the plumber turns out to have an incorrect voter registration. He probably could not get a name. Well, he's not even a plumber, it turns out. <laughs> right. Not licensed, not a plumber, and his name is misspelled on his voter registration. That means that you have to have a staff, not small staff, to go through all those things. And basically that just slows everything down. One thing we've learned in the domain name world is that people expect that when they apply for a name, they'll get a yes or no right away. Uh, that's an expectation that people have. We don't want to disappoint it. So I believe that the correct way is to have a responsive operating company that can raise money and be a for-profit that the community concern should be dealt with by an oversight board. This is how it works through most of Europe now. Um, and that challenges should be done post facto. You should have rules that you want to enforce. And um, for valuable names, you might have stipulations about how they might, must be used. But what you don't want to do is create a backlog uh, without staffing to deal with it and slow things down. So like .us does, there should be a nexus policy and it should be subject, the name should be subject to challenge, but it shouldn't be gummed up at the, at the beginning. We could spend hours. I really appreciate this. We look forward to more discussion. And Great. This was a good hearing, and I thank you very much for contributing. Thank, uh, thank you very much. I think that Jack is here. I come on, would you like to say something, sir? Okay. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you. Mr. Gizmo, how are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, I'm Coordinator Emeritus of Gizmo, uh, Councilwoman, as you know, because you're a member. And I started that organization. Why don't you introduce yourself, even though Jack, I know. Jack Eichenbaum, Coordinator Emeritus of Gizmo. And the organization started in 1990, which has a lot to do with what I'm going to be saying here. Um, <clears throat> we tried to develop a, a, a user group for a new technology called Geographic Information Systems here in the city. And, we were pretty successful at that, but there were barriers. And oh, are there barriers. And the barriers are that most people, quite rightly, justifiably for their own concerns, think rather parochially about the city. They don't think about the whole city. And I think of dot .NYC as a, symbolically as the people who think about the city as a whole. And I think of it as a merit badge, in a way, for, uh, for individuals and <clears throat> people who use that term. Uh, as people who are thinking about the city in general. <clears throat> I'm, I'm familiar with several organizations I'm, that everyone in this room knows. There's city government, and city government is divided into agencies. And most people take their agencies very seriously, more seriously than New York City, because it's the agencies that promote them, it's the agencies that give them rewards, and the agencies that provide them a workplace and have a chairman who's concerned about the agency. And the same way in city council, people are elected to the city council through districts, and they know about the boundaries of those districts, and their first job is to report to those districts and become reelected by these districts. And same with committees in city council, they break the city down. The same, I'm now associated with academia, and there, every academic institution has departments. And I remember when I was doing a master's degree in chemistry, how there was a chemical, there was a chemical physics and physics department and physical chemistry and the chemistry, they never talked to each other. And all of these things are very real to the people inside them, but are real barriers to people who are trying to integrate and synthesize things at a higher level. And the higher level that we're all concerned with here, particularly in city council, is the betterment of this city that we call New York. And even that, most people think of as the five boroughs, and it really isn't just that. It extends way beyond that into a city-state that goes way up the Hudson and into New England and into New Jersey. It's more than, it doesn't just end at the Nassau-Queens line or the Queens, all this stuff. We've got to think bigger, and there need to be people, not everybody's going to do this, but there need to be people who integrate all the time. Integration of knowledge on, this, on the larger New York City level is so needed by all, our, all of our institutions. Not everybody's going to do this, but the people in .NYC better be doing that. And that's the merit badge. That's the symbol of how we can 
begin some higher level thinking that go beyond the parochial concerns of the institutions that we work in. Thank you. Thank you very much. We all listen carefully to what you have to say and based on your history and your ongoing interest in our city. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate everyone's uh, participation today. I think this is a topic that generated more interest than most would have thought and um, we will certainly continue it. We look forward to um, figuring out what ICANN is proposing and how New York City can benefit and what the best procedures are, looking perhaps at other cities, but always keeping in mind that we're unique. So I want to thank the staff and say that this hearing is concluded with much more discussion to come. Thank you. Oh, I also want to thank, I'm sorry, I want to thank Jolie McPhee for his ongoing support of keeping this committee on record. Um, unfortunately, the City Council doesn't seem to webcast anything, so I so appreciate his efforts. Thank you.